Hello Simulation TV viewers, my name is Mike Smell. In this week in the Simulation TV studio, Parker Wright's been putting together a ton of new content for Simulation CFD. In this episode of Simulation in Action, Parker will be talking to us about Simulation CFD for electronics cooling. Hey, this is Parker Wright with the Simulation team. And in this episode of Simulation TV, I'll be talking about Autodesk Simulation CFD for electronics. All right, so we'll start with what is CFD, and check out this, uh, this showcase shot of our gaming console while we're at it. Pretty, pretty unbelievable. So CFD is the modeling of air and fluid flow as it interacts with surrounding solids. It's in its simplest form. It stands for computational fluid dynamics. In this case, fluid could be liquid, gas, air with electronics cooling, typically air through an enclosure, but we can also run water uh, as well for really you know, very high power density applications. Dynamics, of course, means movement. And uh, in this case, of course, we're going to be modeling the uh, temperature and thermal effects as well uh, within and outside enclosures, looking at heat sinks, chips, and I'll get into more of that here in just a second. So let's take a quick look. So just a quick overview, uh, showcase demo video combined with simulation CFD results. We're going to take a quick fly around and look at uh, how these two tools integrate with each other. We actually have an app on the App Store, Autodesk App Store, that allows you to pull your simulation CFD results into Showcase and create these, uh, these videos, these animations, these stills, very high resolution, high quality way to communicate with your customers. A little top down view there, and now we see the traces of the airflow coming in the side, going through the heat sink and through the shroud out through the fan. It's really neat, really intuitive visual way to uh, to understand exactly what's going on in the enclosure. And of course, you know, think about sales and marketing as well. Now we're looking at the uh, the thermal cameras that are built into Simulation CFD. So now, in, in this case, we're seeing the temperatures on the the disk drive and on the heat sink as well. And we can find those hot spots and make some design changes to eliminate them. So very cool. All right. So why are electronics companies simulating? So if you look at the Aberdeen report. Um, the top five pressures that are driving change in, in improving product performance, the top two quoted by both small and medium businesses and large businesses are shorting, shortening development schedules and reducing development costs. So obviously we need to design and build these electronics assemblies uh, more quickly. We need to cut down on prototyping at, during the, the development phase. We want to digital prototype as much as we can because it's much less expensive than physical prototyping. And we get a lot more test data out of it as well. So simulation ties into both of those top two uh, business pressures very nicely. And then as far as the prototyping goes, um, you know, I've worked in the electronics field for a long time and, and have experienced this firsthand. It can be very costly and very expensive to prototype. And when you test, there's only a limited amount of information you can get out of the, uh, the, the testing phase. So, you know, we see going from low to very high complexity, the time required, the costs associated with that, and how much we can save with a pretty standard uh, reduction in cost savings that we that uh, leading firms see with simulation. So you can see as the uh, complexity of your prototypes goes up and the part, part count goes up and you uh, continue to push the envelope, the, the cost savings that are available to you can be uh, significant. So what types of applications can we tackle with simulation CFD for electronics? So these are all really nice fits for, for, for Autodesk, um, force convection, natural convection, external flow, and water cooling. So force convection, using a fan to move air through a box and cool chips or heat sinks. Uh, natural convection is using the buoyant effects that, uh, you know, the fact that hot air, in, hot air rises, using that to drive flow, develop and drive flow over a heat sink. Um, external flow, so maybe if we have something outside uh, or on, you know, maybe on a military vehicle or, or on an airplane, using that external flow as a cooling mechanism. And then, as I mentioned before, with very high power density electronics, um, transmitters, amplifiers, we even might want to investigate water cooling. So at what level is simulation CFD typically used for electronics cooling? Well, the levels vary, you know, so we have firms that, and companies that run component level studies. So they're actually looking at chip placement on boards and the effects of different via placements and sizes and through hole locations, um, different leads, different substrates for chips. We have companies doing board level simulations where they're looking at I squared R or dual heating, or again, maybe component placement or even board thicknesses are looking at some different substrate types. Um, system level studies are very common. so. Um, electronics enclosures. So imagine, you know, 10 boards 
uh, SR, SRAs or, or modules that slide down wedge lock into an enclosure? How do we properly cool those in the back plane, or how do we drive uh, you know drive air or fluid? Um, or even oil in some cases over top of the correct components so we can keep them nice and cool and keep our mean time between failures uh, very high, keep our maintainability high. And then we have a lot of uh, firms doing room level studies as well. So some electronics companies will also run these more data center level studies to understand at a macro level, you know, what's happening to the racks, what's, you know, how are the air conditioners um, improving the, the cooling within the room and how does the, the air respond uh, to the, both the buoyant effects and the, the forced uh, nature in the subfloor. Here's a quick shot of a data center. So again, uh, we have a lot of customers doing these types of studies where they're looking at, uh, at force flow through the subfloor, up through the racks and ceiling, putting them in back, and then you know, strategically locating racks and tiles in order to maximize the cooling efficiency or power usage efficiency of their data centers. Simulation CFD is also a really natural fit for, for lighting. So um, being that uh, Sim CFD is CAD agnostic, we work with all the different CAD systems, so SOLIDWORKS, Pro Engineer, CATIA, NX, uh, Solid Edge, Space Claim. Many small LED uh, startup companies are using Simulation CFD to bring, you know, to innovate and bring their products to market faster. And we also have larger lighting companies who have a long and, and storied history in traditional lighting who are transitioning over to LEDs as well. So, you know, LEDs are very efficient, but they're also uh, very dense in terms of the power that's generated per square or per unit area. So, again, a very nice fit. Also, typically with lighting, um, in some rare instances, this isn't the case, but typically you're looking at natural convection problems. You know, we have uh, lights that are hung from the ceiling or maybe replacement bulbs. So natural convection problems are very difficult to solve with rules of thumb and, and just by doing hand calculations. You really need computational fluid dynamics to properly solve those. And it's very surprising the results you get sometimes. Uh, reducing the complexity of a heat sink can often make it perform better. So we see a lot of over design out there until simulations brought in house in the lighting market. All right, so let's take a quick look at a demonstration of the, the tool in action. So this is our gaming system. We saw that, uh, that cool uh, still shot and fly through earlier on. And we're gonna start here in Autodesk Inventor. But as I said before, this works exactly the same with any of the other CAD tools. Um, native integration within the CAD tools and a very solid connection so that we can leverage names and materials of, uh, of parts in your CAD system and automatically map those conditions over into Sim CFD. So I'll talk about that in just a bit as well. So here's our live launch. We're now in Simulation CFD and we'll start setting this model up. So I'm gonna start with the exterior enclosure and um, we'll assign this as a as, you know, plastic housing, obviously, ABS in this case. And we have an extensive material database, but you can also create your own materials. Okay, now we're assigning properties to the air volume and uh, you probably didn't notice, but that air volume did not exist in Inventor. So Simulation CFD recognized that that was an airtight internal void and actually created a new air part for us automatically. It's part of the automation. Now we're setting up the circuit board. And if we take a look here, there's a, a lot of intelligence in our circuit board editor. So we'll freeze it here and we can see that we get the total thermal conductivities orthotropically both in plane and through plane due to the traces, the layers, the planes, and the via groupings and the pads on the board. So uh, we don't have to perform uh, intensive calculations to determine that. That's automatically determined by the program. Now we're leveraging rules. So we're looking at the names of the parts. We create rules one time so that those material properties are automatically set up in the system based on the name. So once we create those rules one time, the set setup is automated from then on. Okay, so now let's take a look at, the, at how to set up a fan. So it's very easy to import a, a, uh, an Excel file and set up a fan curve that's you know, direct from your data sheet. We can even plot that up and make sure that we have consistency from the data sheet to the, to the program. And we have many, many fans built into simulation CFD already, you know, Comair and NIDEC fans, uh, so that you can just drag and drop and, and essentially uh, set those up immediately. Okay, so we have our air part, our fan, our PCB. We also have compact thermal uh, models in the, uh, in, our, in the database, which I'll show during the results portion of this. But in, at this point in time, it's time for us to set up the boundary conditions. So for a force convection simulation, we want to assign uh, zero pressures on all of the inlet and outlet surfaces because we're gonna drive the flow with the fan. That will be the momentum source. 
Um, we can also set up a flow rate at an external surface if we know exactly how much flow we'll push through. But in this case, we're going to let the program tell us where on the fan curve, based on the system pressure response, is this uh, particular gaming system going to operate. The other thing we can do is use the rules to automate the setup of boundary conditions. So the pressures, the temperatures, the velocities, the flow rates, the thermal uh, dissipations, those can all be automatically set up with this rules dialog as well. So we have some rules based on the names of the components. And we'll just go ahead and apply those now. And you can set those to apply automatically upon launch as well. But now if we dig in, we can see that all of our chips have a thermal dissipation assigned to them and all of our boundary conditions have been updated on the external surfaces as well. So we can see that on the, uh, on the inlet surfaces, we actually end up with a pressure and a temperature, and we need a temperature on the inlet. So that tells the system, you know, at what is the ambient, at, at what ambient temperature am I operating at? So this is essentially on a virtual test bench. And as I said, we'll have infinite data at our fingertips once we solve this. So the next step is to mesh the model. Okay, so we hit this automatic size um, function here in, in the dialog, and that goes in and looks at edge length and curvature. So anywhere we have smaller surfaces or edges, we'll see more of these light blue dots, these preview points. And anywhere that the surfaces or edges are longer or straighter or have less detail, we'll see the mesh kind of grow and expand as we work, uh, work away towards those. And that's all about maximizing the resources of our mesher and solver, you know, best utilizing them. We did a quick mesh preview on the heatsink, which you saw. And uh, one other best practice that we'll do here is to go in and actually tighten down the mesh on the fan materials. You know, there are very high pressure and velocity gradients as we work through the fans, and they're solving for the flow rate based on the fan curve. So we want a little bit more fidelity, a little bit more data there to get a better solution. So now let's set up uh, the solving. So we'll run this as, uh, as incompressible flow, of course. And we'll, we'll turn on flow, heat transfer, and also click off that auto force convection button. And what that'll do is solve the flow solution and then freeze that and then solve the heat transfer solution and then combine the two. So it just speeds up the process. So now we're looking at results. We can see the thermal profiles. We can see the thermal plume coming off the heat sink. We can take this cut plane and slice and dice through the model and basically look at, at any point within the model. We can plot this up, get qualitative or quantitative data and then what I'll typically do, you know, I like looking at temperatures on the solids and then flipping the cut plane over to show velocity. So we're showing the speed of air through the unit. We can see it streaming around the heat sink and a majority of the flow is actually bypassing the heat sink and going straight to the fan. And we can even see the biasing on the fan of the temperatures and that's just a result of it totally missing the heat sink. So we want to do something, you know, we're already thinking about design changes, we want to go back and do something to normalize the flow through the heat sink. Okay, so now we'll get some of that quantitative data. So we'll drop in a plot at the heat sink outlet side and understand what the velocity profile is across that heat sink. And then again, make some changes to try to drive that up as well. The more flow we can push through the heat sink, the more cooling we'll get due to force convection and heat transfer from the heat sink into the air, and the less likely we'll be to end up with a component that's going to overheat. Then the last thing I'll look at here before we change the, the design is this compact thermal model. So we can see the board temperature, the heat flux, the case temperature, the junction temperature, and then go back and match that up with the data sheet and ensure that, this, uh, that the performance of the uh, component, the temperature, is well within spec. We'll actually also make those uh, what we call summary parts. So we want to be able to refer to those later once we make the design changes. And then the last thing I'll do here is set up an ISO surface. So ISO means one. And this is a cloud of flow that shows one single value. So we just saw some temperature ISOs, and now we're looking at some velocity ISO surfaces. So this is a very intuitive way to show how much flow is bypassing the heatsink and going straight to the fan. So that's just wasted energy. We'll make a couple of design changes so that we can look at, you know, what happens if we add a shroud around the fans? Or what happens if we change the heat sink to be a pin fin heat sink? Or what happens maybe if we move the inlet so that the air isn't streaming in and deadheading directly against the side of the heat sink? So in this case, we're showing the comparison between the baseline and the updated design. And look at the difference in the temperature of the heat sink and thus the component as well, which is tremendous. That's with a very simple design change. We just added in a, you know, our inexpensive you know, plastic part to kind of shroud the heat sink and draw more flow through it. And we move the inlets very slightly as well. So let's look at some more comparisons now. We'll actually open up three windows where we have the baseline, 
the updated design with the shroud, and then another updated design where we've shrouded it and also switched over to an elliptical pin fin heat sink. So you've probably seen these in the market. You've probably been thinking about these. You can use simulation to understand how effective are those. And what we actually find is that the pin fin heat sink performs a little bit worse than the standard extruded heat sink. So this is an opportunity to save cost, save money, and, and still improve product performance. So now you probably never would have guessed that we would actually have better heat transfer coefficients and better heat transfer in general off of a standard extruded off the shelf um, commercially available item, but that's the case. So again, here we're seeing the ISO surface comparison. We can see that, that none of the flow ends up bypassing the heat sink this time. We're driving almost all of it through there at the, uh, the problematic velocity that we saw before. So we know again that this is, has been a successful design change and it's, it's very easy for us to you know, run a few of these overnight, come in in the morning and, and compare them immediately to understand that. Here we're looking at comparisons between the board temperatures. So we get this nice visual output. Um, that's why I selected these earlier and made these summary items so that um, Simulation CFD would remember to go you know, grab those and chart those for me so I can get this instant comparison again from one design to the next. So the best design in the middle, again, is the one with the extruded heat sink, not with the more complicated pin fin heat sink. And then one of the last things we'll do here is look at the actual velocity at the outlet of the heat sink. Again, we've continued to drive that up using the shrouding and so um, we've been successful on all fronts in, uh, in making some changes to drive down those temperatures and drive up reliability. And the last shot here is just, again, using that thermal camera, animating some of the trace particles through so we can track you know, how they migrate through the box, where they tend to go. Are, they, are there any areas of um, stagnation or recirculation? You know, those are problematic. Those are areas that would get very hot. If you've ever seen a uh, stagnation or recirculation zone directly over a hot component, uh, you know what that equates to, and it's thermal runaway. So we want to make sure we avoid that as well, and just be really strategic and intentional with how we're directing the airflow. And then the last one here, we'll do one final fly through. So we've uh, we've optimized the design. We have arrived at the final configuration that we know we want to take to market. So let's go and market and sell this, you know, on the website or with using social media or whatever the case may be. It's extremely compelling. So we can actually give the customer a very visceral visual fly-through experience within this assembly. I mean, it's just amazing. Looking at the CFD results, understanding how the air moves in, you know, bringing invisible product performance to life. This is the best example I think I've ever seen of it. And we can see exactly what's happening very intuitively inside the box and communicate to our stakeholders, our investors, our customers, our clients, the general public, why this is the best design and how we differentiate ourselves with our core competency. It's really impactful. So if you have any additional questions, feel free to reach out to me directly at parker.right at autodesk.com. I hope this was informative and enjoyable, and I appreciate your time.